welcome to the High Stakes Deals podcast. I'm your host, Brandon, and today I am joined by real estate broker, lender, investor, probably a few other titles, Mr. Greg Sharp. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well, Brandon. It's exciting to be here with you. I always enjoy talking to you. Yeah, you know, it's funny is that, you know, I've been on a couple podcasts. Now I'm doing my own podcast series. And I think you were the first person that interviewed me for a podcast and now I'm interviewing you. So it's kind of a nice to, I can, I can put you kind of in the hot seat today a little bit. Yeah, that, that's, that's all right by me. We've got plenty to talk about all the time. And you know, even though I've known you for a long time, I was thinking about this ahead of time. Like, what can I ask Greg? I want to, I want to, I want to hear the stories that Greg's never told me. I'm sure there's a few in there. So, um, Goodness. to, to hop right in, because I know we don't have a ton of time just to kind of throw my first one at you. Um, let me ask you, why do you think people should be investing in real estate? Why should people buy rental properties? Why should people buy land, do developments in general? Why do you think, I know you're a real estate guy. Why should people invest in real estate? Number one, at the lower level for everybody in the United States, real estate's a poverty breaker. If you own real estate, even if it's just your own house, then you've got assets at the end of your life that you're able to pass on to your generations and you don't have the expense of renting. And it, it breaks the poverty cycle if you can keep your house. Then the next step is, after you've got your own house, you need an investment property. Because once you pay off a 30 year mortgage, it's just free and clear income, which stabilizes you for retirement. Correct. If you have a fourplex that you live in, then you've got your rental, your rental income covers your living expenses. So just those two properties stabilize everybody. And uh, then beyond that, real estate's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Uh, lots of problems to solve. It gets technical. And real estate comes in cycles, and you can build great wealth, and you have great disasters, too. And it's knowing when and where to go to find the best deals. That's, uh, that's the, the, the art of the deal, so to speak. Art of the deal. Careful with those words now. You put that in words, yeah. <laughs> so, but what do you say to somebody, and I don't want to target the millennials. I'm kind of a millennial, by the way. I'm like the older millennial, uh, I guess. Um, but, but what do you say to somebody, millennial or not, that, that has no interest in, in buying an investment property? They don't like real estate. Maybe, maybe they watched their parents lose houses in the last recession. Um, Maybe, maybe they're just misinformed. Maybe they like stocks. But what do you say to those people that say, nah, I just want to rent, Greg. What, what, what a, you know, why buy? There's a time for renting. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely a time for renting. And uh, if you can rent and, and save money, great. Uh, if you're not able to save rent, but you can't afford a house, uh, save money while you're renting and you can't afford a house, well, you need to work harder. Uh, basically, you've got to have a financial plan. My kids are 21 and 23. And uh, they're both making good money right now. Uh, surprised they're making so much. I'm, I'm being challenged to make more money because of how much they're making already. <laughs> there you go. That, but you did something right if that's the case. They're <laughs> out on the couch going, Dad, uh, what should we do today? Yeah, well, the older one's much more astute, and she's got plans, and she's taken all the right steps, has a financial advisor. So she's not taking my advice anymore, but she's got the professionals behind her to get her plan so that she's taken care of. The younger one is a little bit behind uh, on that sort of planning, but she's just more of a free spirit. But if you're, if you're going to be not investing in real estate, uh, make a plan. And putting a couple hundred a month away right now, you've got the leverage of time, you know, the time leverage of money, you will have a nest egg to work with. You're still going to have to have a house. I agree. I mean, you have to live somewhere. And sometimes, like you said, maybe renting makes sense because of the flexibility factor, or maybe it's less expensive. Sometimes in a lot of cases, it's more expensive, really. But, um, but there is a time and a place. But I agree. I mean, a big picture, look at how much you spend. I mean, if you rented for 30 or 40 or 50 years, I mean, how much did you really spend? Even if you're in a rent control area, you spent a lot of money that and, and at the end of it, it's like, okay, see you later, you know, but, but, you know, real estate's not like that, obviously. So, Obviously, I, I feel the same way. Um, but but take me back. It's kind of like businesses, they they buy and they rent their buildings. Oh, that's true. And yeah. It, it's it's a financial decision you have to make. But if you don't have a financial plan for success, uh, real estate's the way to go because it's passive. Right. Exactly. So, Greg, take me back, and we'll get back into the we'll segue back into the real estate side of things. But take me back growing up. Where where did you grow up? Big family, small family. <laughs> What's your, because honestly, I don't even know. I mean, I know a little bit maybe, but, but, but tell me about, about Greg, uh, 
30, 40, 50 years ago? I'm not going to say the number, whatever the number is. Yeah. Um, I was actually born in Evansville, Indiana, moved yeah. to Oregon when I was five, and that's where I grew up. I grew up in Astoria and uh, still love that area. Um, when I got married, I wanted to, I was living in Alabama at the time. My wife was from Minnesota and she liked the warmth of Alabama. Yeah. But I wanted to be on the West Coast. So I said, let's take a tour. So I visited friends from Juneau, Seattle, Portland, Astoria, Los, uh, Los Angeles, and San Diego. And my wife said, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara South was okay. Everything else was too cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so her I mean, you know my fiance is from minnesota morgan you know and and now it's like a 60 day you know uh, a 60 degree day is cold right i mean after she's been here for four or five years so i've never spent a winter in minnesota i've been there in the fall and it gets really cold really fast so <clears throat> imagine after a while you're probably like over it when it's freezing yep my wife just visited her dad for his birthday in wisconsin and she said i all the clothes i took with me i wore every day because <laughs> it was cold <laughs> <laughs> like five layers. Yeah. Yeah. Like five layers of blunt man or something. And so, so you bounced around, you're from Indiana, you went to Oregon, you checked out all the places and you guys ultimately decided on what was it? Was it Orange County? Is that where you, you moved to? Well, where the good rental was, uh, was in Irvine. And so my wife picked it out and said, we, let's live in Irvine. I was working in Cerritos at the time, had a company move for me. My corporate background is engineering. Okay. I've got, um, undergraduate in chemical engineering, graduate graduate work in optics, and I worked for a number of years in uh, the optical industry, kind of a, a high energy laser physicist. And the uh, prototypes for shooting down uh, airplanes, the President Reagan Star Wars program, if you've ever heard of that, yeah. I, I was one of the engineers working on that. Well, and see, it's funny because the joke for me, in, and you know this, like when we work together has always been, oh yeah, Greg's my guy that can build rockets. You know, I'm pretty sure he can build a rocket, a nuke, a something, you know, because all the stuff yeah. that you do and, and it's, you're a smart guy. That's all I can say. Well, the nuclear Navy turned me down. Uh, they wouldn't take me because I had flat feet and uncorrected vision beyond a certain limit. Uh, so with two strikes, they wouldn't take me. They took my friend, uh, but they, they, didn't take me. So I could have been in the nuclear Navy and doing optics and all sorts of stuff. So I, I've had a, a variety of things. And uh, actually, November 3rd, I'm heading out on vacation. I'm going to go dig, dig gold up in the Siskiyou National Forest. Oh, okay. So stop right there. Tell me about the gold thing, because this is actually an interesting topic. And from what I remember, you in your free time like to go to these random areas. Like I'm, I'm picturing like Joshua Tree or somewhere. And you've got a big safari hat on maybe and you're like out there like for hours digging for gold. I mean, is that is that what you do? Tell me about this whole situation. Uh, that's exactly it. Uh, <laughs> this, you know, I don't I'm at my desk way too much. So I need exercise. So going out, this gets me outside, outdoors, the sunshine. And, uh, you know, I tell my wife that it, it, it you know, eventually this is going to pay off. So it's a hobby that makes me money. Um, so far, not. <laughs> in fact, let me let's see in my desk drawer. I don't know if you can hear it, but. Uh, there you go. So what's your biggest score you ever made digging for gold? I mean, how does the, if you get a flake, is that a good day or? or? So far, yes. Um, Mainly, it's been building my knowledge and ability. I've got the equipment now, and this time I'm going out with a friend who sold me some of my first gold mining equipment. Wow. And we're going to be on his claim. There's gold there. We just have to process the dirt and make sure we're looking in the right locations. Uh, he generally pulls in 50 to 100 ounces a year doing his thing. Wow. So and uh, so maybe for the 10 days. Say again? Is he a semi? Is that considered like a semi professional? Yeah. Old miner, basically. <clears throat> he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. So, so the the claim thing. So, because I just assumed it's some big national park or public land or something, uh, maybe private land, but where you you pay a fee and you get access and you go out there for the weekend. But when you say a claim, do you have to actually buy or or pay money to claim a certain like square radius or c circular radius of a of a piece of property, and that's all you can dig on? Yeah, well, this is where it gets interesting it's still related to real estate because you've seen in all the uh, title reports, they will exclude mineral rights. Oh, okay. And so you've got water and mineral rights. So on these national lands, the federal lands, you can go prospecting. If you find a viable uh, source of minerals, whether it's gold, platinum, iridium, water, you can put a claim in and claim like a 40 acre parcel or so many, so many plate, you know, square feet or miles, 
And then you have the mineral rights that you can go in and extract those as long as you comply with all the other laws. Wow. So I'm actually on the mineral rights side of real estate. So it's not that much different than real estate already. There, there you go. It's amazing. I mean, it, is there a big picture there? I know it's a hobby, but is there a big picture there? Could you, could you do something on a, on a grandiose scale with, with gold mining? Um, it'll help me build a war chest if I can find a good place. My friend is fully retired. He's now, uh, his wife passed away. So he's got free time and he's actually buying a claim out in Arizona or the desert somewhere so he can do mining where we're going in the summer and then in Arizona in the winter and he'll pull in lots of money. And, and if I can get 10, 20, $50,000 a year in extra income just for playing in the dirt. You, that you find enjoyable, right? Actually, the first thing is I would like to uh, take the first few ounces, go to Arkansas in the diamond mine there it's a public diamond mine in the United States. There you go. Find a diamond, get the gold, and then I'm going to ask my wife to uh, renew our vows and we'll make new rings from the stuff I find in the ground. Beautiful. And with the extra leftover diamonds, you'll buy some Bitcoin and, and you'll be set. Yeah, it's multiple streams of income. That, that's what I'm working on. So all that being said, how did you, you come out to California, you're not working in real estate at the time. I don't know if you had any background or family or friends in real estate, but you come out here you guys land in Irvine, you're working in Cerritos, um, doing your, I'm going, I'm just going to say your scientific high levels, smart type. Yeah. Work. So you start that. How do you get into real estate? I was getting tired of working for overpromoted engineers. Okay. And one of my colleagues in Alabama at the time, he was investing in stocks and he was flipping houses. And uh, so he inspired me. So when I moved to California, I, I said, you know, I'm going to learn about this. And because he had extra income coming in. His name's Randy Lindsay. He's now running a software company for a, uh, a day trading stock company. Wow. And uh, if I'm going to invest in stocks, which is also on my list of things to do, I'm going to buy his software because it's all analytical, which is what I love. Nice. And uh, he says the single indicator for stocks is volume. If the volume's moving, you've got a trend. Well, it's the same thing in real estate. In fact, my modeling that I've done for you in the past, it's all based off of the stock analysis. Mm. So while one share of stock is exactly identical to the next share of stock, houses are a little bit different, but they're mostly the same. Mm. So I can use the same stock trading analysis for analyzing markets and identifying short-term trends. And I see a, a negative trend possibly forming in the multifamily market in Orange County. Right. Uh, it's all related, these property rights, analysis, investing, and, and so forth. So your friend at the time, he's doing real estate, and because of your interest in these types of analytics, and maybe that's why you've always been drawn more to the investment side of things, but yes. what's the first physical step? Do you go get a real estate license? Do you partner on a deal with him, or do you buy something? What, what gets you? Uh, I uh, happen to have some extra money, and a friend of mine uh, said, hey, I've got a hard money loan for you. I said, what's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you know me with hard money now. <laughs> the hard money. Okay, let's see what this is. <laughs> so I did my first hard money loan, uh, and that was a taste of real estate, and I was getting 12% interest. Oh, so you, so you were on the, like, the investor side. Like you I, I was the lender side. Yeah, right, and you gave it to the hard money lender broker. It, it, it got, got loans to somebody that had a property. And yeah. 12%. So you're getting the whole 12% or a portion of that 12% back monthly pro rata based on your share of that loan. Is that kind of how it worked? Yeah, it worked out great. And then I decided I'm going to go ahead and get my real estate license. And a friend of mine who helped me buy my first investment property, he was my first broker. Oh, wow. And I talked to him and I said, I want to buy an investment property, something like a, a, a two to four unit property. He says, well, I've never done that before, Greg, but I have this analysis spreadsheet but it's only in hard copy yeah. so i said give it to me give it to me so i basically reverse engineered a hard copy of a spreadsheet to analyze properties and, and have the spreadsheet for him hey listen nobody should ever dare you to take something on paper and slam it in 16 pages of excel because you'll do that talk about for fun if you're not gold mining you'll be staying up <clears> doing that so I, I know this to be true and but that it's all of this stuff ties together it's all related in certain ways and the analysis is something that I find most real real estate people don't know how to do. They don't know how to do deals. And so I focused on 
you know, the, the academic intellectual side of things to, for the analysis to find and analyze deals to make sure we're doing the right thing. Now, making decisions in the right market, it's a different skill set that uh, I didn't have mastered early on. I took some lumps for that. To jump in there, I think I was going to say, I mean, typically I've found that people are either the big picture, right? They can see the big picture vision. We know we should buy this land over here. We know that the market's, you know, this is right time, right place. But a lot of those people are really bad with the ana analytical side of it. Then you've got the analytical yeah. side of things where you can do these performas and cap rates and calculate IRR. And you can really get down to things like an MBA person with an MBA would. And some of those people aren't always big. So a lot of times the best teams are when you can merge those two, you know, skill sets and person. Yeah. I work best with a street smart person. I'm very academic. People say I'm smart, but I'm academic. There you go. And so I can analysis very well. And, uh, Sticker, by the way, I'm not smart. I'm academic. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there's a difference. Uh, there's street smarts and there's book smarts. I'm I'm the book smart portion. I've got that in spades. Right. Honestly, when it comes to reading people, I, I think I'm still a bit naive and overly trusting mm -hmm. because uh, uh, in real estate, you can get in with bad people and bad things happen. Right. And uh, you've encountered that yourself. Of course. Of course. And uh, the, the key is is being conservative. And uh, having the ability to be conservative means you've got to have a lot of money to have the reserves to make the right decisions. Do you think that's what holds people back or uh, if someone's held back in real estate investing or they you know, go out of business or they have a bad deal, do you think it's usually because of a lack of liquidity? Is that what you're saying? Liquidity and making smart decisions. People get too carried away with their emotions. And when you're in a rising market, you don't have to be too smart. You just have to do something. Tides lift all boats. Is that what the something? That's the thing. And I have found whether it's been in technology or real estate, wherever, if you're in front of a trend, you will make far more money than trying to scrap out a living being competitive. Mm. So it's more important to find a trend and get on board than anything else. Anything else. However, the caveat is with your own house, that's a, a long-term thing that you can be in. And over time, you make your money. I guess, and by the way, and that's something I want to get to, but I guess that was earlier, I was thinking about that when we were talking about the buying the house and maybe speaking to millennials or people who don't own property. Because sometimes people get it, and I know this from my background as a, as a realtor, right? I would have clients that would say, ah, I really don't want to buy. I think the market's going to crash this year. I don't want to buy because I'm pretty sure, you know, depending on how this election goes, something's going to go bad next year. Like, you know, and, and what happens is I found a lot of times the same clients, I'll talk to them three, four, five years later, they still haven't bought anything. And the market's actually gone up or it's been great. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is if, depending on the motivation factor for doing either buying your own house or purchasing an investment, would you say even if the market's kind of not the best, that still there could be reasons why it makes sense to transact? I mean, should people just be on the sidelines indefinitely, always waiting for the best time or should they look at the bigger picture and get in if they're going to get in? For your own house, get in because you're going to stay there for 30 years. You're going to pay it off and then it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like dollar cost averaging in stocks. You're in your own house. No matter whether it goes up or down, you're still going to live there. Right. Now, uh, for your first investment property, you might want to be a little more cautious about the timing. You want to make sure that you can afford it and you've got the cash flow. Real estate's a rich man's game. Mm. You cannot be effective as a full-time real estate investor unless you have a passive cash flow to feed the family. Right. Because when you have to make decisions, when, you, when the market forces you to make a decision or your income makes you make bad decisions because you have to have the money or the cash flow, you're screwed. You're absolutely screwed. That's where people go under. Like, I know I shouldn't sell this, this, this property right now, but I have to because I, my other income's dried up or I'm reluctant mm -hmm. on this sale from a speculative standpoint. I have to get it done now. Whereas if you didn't have to and you had the staying power and you could hold on to that for X amount of more time, then the outcome might be significantly better for you. But you're sitting there with that, with that something yeah. going, you gotta, you gotta sell. One of my mentors always told me, keep your powder dry, you know, never lose your capital. Uh, don't sell a bad investment because eventually it'll come back and you'll have your capital to work with. Lock in the loss if you, if you don't have to. Yeah. If you lose all your capital, you've got nothing to work with and you still have to make money to feed the family. Right. So it's kind of a double whammy if you're full time in real estate. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, I've, I've found too, a lot of people, you know, start off what maybe a realtor or they own some type of, you know, maybe a medical practice or they're a lawyer and they start buying properties and investing. And then uh, there becomes a certain point that maybe now you're making enough from the real estate holdings where you can go full time into that if you want to. But 
but most people to be successful, you got to have that other, that other income driver, those other streams. There's something else going on before you just become a full-time real estate investor. Yeah. There was a, a guy I knew who flipped houses very successfully. He would do skip tracing and find people and, and have them sign over deeds to him. It was very successful. And he said, well, I got this house because it pays my food bill every month. I got these three houses because they pay my rent. I've got this house for the car payment. So when you can have a, a number of real estate investment properties while you have a job, as soon as you win the cash flow game, like Robert Kiyosaki's get, game, uh, Cash Flow for Kids or Cash Flow 101, when the passive income covers your expenses, then you can go into real estate full time. The rat race, then you can do whatever you want. You can sit on exactly and how to buy more real estate, but you have that, that monthly amount of money coming in which is exactly why every young person needs to figure out how they can make money in real estate right. and build their passive cash flow because their expenses are low. Right. The moment you, uh, once you, you have a, a wife and a kid and you live in downtown LA, sound familiar? Yeah, sounds very familiar. Yeah. Your monthly nut is bigger. When you're single and a starving student, your threshold is very low buy a duplex with some partners, build some equity through your living experience, then keep that when you buy the house with the family right. and you've got your first investment property because in 30 years, you know, with, from someone who can look back 30 years, <laughs> it goes really fast, faster than you really expect. And you'll have that income and it's, it's liberating and you, nobody controls you then. It's all about controlling the direction of your life. And that's the freedom that real estate gives you. It gives you. No, I, I couldn't agree more, man. I think everybody should buy real estate, you know, whether it's investment or their house, uh, land, you know, land's a different animal. You know, you probably shouldn't have big mortgages on land. Maybe that should be more lower leverage or paid in cash, but, uh, but there's all kinds of real estate. And I'm obviously like you, a big proponent of real estate. But I want to ask you real quick, going back to, I mean, you touched on having a mentor. We started getting into, you know, maybe your progression as a real estate person. Um, a big topic that I wanted to cover today was your condo conversion business. I know that that, that there must, and by the way, I know there's got to be some high stakes deals in there that we can talk about, but what got you into condo conversions? Did you set up a company? Did you have partners? T take me through like the zero to 60 on, because I think you built a pretty impressive portfolio with the condo conversions. And I want to <clears throat> hear how you did that. My claim to fame is I've done a hundred million in transactions. Very few people can say that. A million. You know, that in technology, I've started companies, built them. I've been signed tasks to build businesses and I have, and I went out on my own and did a hundred million. Uh, I build businesses. That's what I'm really good at. And so it started out was I want to do real estate and uh, I was at a Robert Allen seminar and uh, I, and he, it's the pre seminar. Okay. When they're trying to sell you on it. And I said, call up my wife said, I think I can do real estate full time, but I need to quit my job to do it. Will you let me quit my job? <laughs> yeah. He's going, Oh uh, shoot. <laughs> and you heard this. Uh, and my wife said, yeah, not meaning yes, do it, but yes, we can talk about it. Right. But all she said was yes. You hang and up and you're like calling your boss. I quit. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so uh, I quit, went full time, and I was trying to find sales, was having a hard time with it. I found a great building, had two clients that should have bought it. One, I still think he was an escaped Nazi and a racist because we're in Long Beach. Long Beach is multiracial as it gets. And he says, I don't know, Greg, I drove by the property and I saw some black people. It's like, oh my gosh, like, seriously. And this is like, uh, this was in uh, uh, 2003. Wow. And uh, it's like, seriously, it's a great investment and it's Long Beach, it's, it's multiracial. And this is, if you're looking in Long Beach, you should expect this. Uh, so he backed out and I you know, put him at arm's length. I, I kept lo looking for tattoos on his arms or the, the, the scars where they covered him up. Uh, yeah, yeah, but anyway, there's another guy who said, I only buy a half mile from the beach. This was at the 800 block of Atlantic in Long Beach. It's six tenths of a mile from the water. It's not half mile from the beach. It's like, this thing cash flows. So I uh, told the, the seller, you know, I can't find a buyer for it. I, I wanna buy it myself. 
I, I'm going to go out and raise the capital. So I took my cash in my 401k, put it all down on this building, which was uh, 14 units, 12 residential and two commercial. How much, how much were they selling it for? 2.3 million. 2.3 million? Yeah. So I had enough for the deposit. And I said, I'm going to put that down, but somebody else put it into escrow. And I said, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go out and try to raise the cash. They might fall out. They fell out, but somebody else put it in. Wow. It fell out again. Uh, I mean, are you getting your hand up in there in the meantime? Or are you saying, hey, listing agent, come on, man. Yeah, um, I was working with him and I didn't realize it, but they were watching me. Mm. And um, I told somebody that I met at the Robert Allen seminar. I said, hey, I, she said, I've always wanted to do condo conversions. I said, well, I'm trying to buy a building and they say it could be converted to a condo. They've already have the map on it. Are you interested? And she was a CPA and she did all the first, my first financial spreadsheet is what she did. And I copied that for years. She got me on my way. And, uh, but then she said, you know, it's just not the right thing for me. I'm out. Mm. And so I was out trying to raise capital to buy the building. And I found some guys that were going to do it. I syndicated and I had a single investor and I'm going in to meet the single investor and the, the syndication people said, Hey, we got the last $50,000. And I said, well, I'm going to sign with my single high net worth individual. Right. This guy that had a 300 million a year condo conversion business wow. and was friends with a listing agent who said, you know, if you do the conversion, here's the guy I'll introduce you to. He was watching me. And one day he calls me up and says, Greg, we're going to partner. I've done this before and I can help you avoid all the landmines. And you're taking all the right steps, doing the right things. You can do this. You're going to do all the dirty work that I don't want to do, but I'm going to bring you a lot of business. Wow. Good call. What do you say to that? Yeah, good call. To, I mean, you better say yes. I said yes. And yes. yeah. <laughs> and so he went with me to meet the high net worth individual. And we closed the deal and started doing the con conversion on that. So let me and just, then, real, real quick. So, um, for people who are listening or will be listening, we've got terms like syndication, condo conversion, you know, maybe start there. What is a condo conversion? Explain, explain how that works. You've got an apartment building and by the way, the other word map, right? So, so you've got yeah. a conversion and a building right now that's an apartment building. How does someone make money with that in layman's terms? Basically it's like subdividing a piece of land and building houses. Okay. You take a big piece of land you build these individual houses and you sell them off individually. I'm taking apartments and a condominium is a legal description. It doesn't mean anything other than it's a subdivided parcel, but there's some common areas. Like the whole building is owned by the association, but you own the air from paint to paint in California. That's what you own. Right. Anything beyond the paint is the association, except for doors and windows. Those are yours. So with the condo conversion, where you're buying apartments, legally entitling it and changing the ownership structure to be individually owned. And then we form the homeowners association for the common areas, which is all the, all the land and the building. So you buy it as an apartment building. It's there's 14 tenants there, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. The objective is to go in and turn it into 14 condos physically, maybe mostly stays the same. I mean, I'm sure you're probably going to paint it and upgrade some stuff yeah. selling units. But the point is, is that structurally it basically is the same building. It's 14 apartments. You come in, now you get it permitted, let's just use that word or approved or re, you know, the changed right on title to be mm -hmm. condos. Now, instead of having 14 units that you rent out, you would sell each of those 14. Correct. To end buyers. And with the goal being that maybe you buy a, an apartment building for 2.3 million, but if you can, you have 14 condos and you can sell them each for $200,000, you turn 2.3 million into 2.8 million or whatever the numbers are. Right. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it. And you have, things to do with it and the entitlements with the city. You've got state law to comply with. You've got tenants to manage. Uh, you give the tenants the right to buy. They have first right of refusal. Okay. If they don't buy, they might get relocation benefits. And then with the department of real estate, you have to have something called the uh, track map. It's, it's either the pink report, yellow report, or the white report. And those give you the right to sell those properties. And, uh, so going back to this deal, you, one of the reasons you identified it as a winner is because, you know, <laughs> buying something that maybe you have to start from scratch, getting this map with all this approval from Sacramento, you've got a building where someone had quietly already gotten it approved for condos. They already had that map, yes. but they had, 
was to operate it as an apartment building. So you could come and just basically turn the light switch on and reactivate that underlying map and fast track the ability to sell these as condos. Right. Uh, it's difficult to get a condo conversion uh, in some jurisdictions, some cities, uh, because they will say, you have to bring everything up to current code. It's like, oh, that's, it's impossible. It's not worth it. Uh, Long Beach was one of those at the time. If you touched it, you had to upgrade it to current code. So that was easier to do. That meant we didn't have to redo the whole infrastructure of the building, like plumbing and so forth. Right. So you go into this deal and you're going to need capital, right? And so right. part of the capital might be a mortgage, but the other part of it needs to be like cash, down payment money, yep. operating reserves. And so that part of it, you, you know that you've got to get from partners, investors, whatever the, the case may be. And when you say syndication, what does that actually mean to somebody that's listening? When I was trying to find the money for this, I found some other real estate agents who had money and they knew people with money. And it was a great deal because they had a great return. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, my single investor that ended up funding that deal, I doubled his money in one year. He gave me half a million and I wrote him a million dollar check at the end of the project after I think one year and one day. Phil, by the way, I mean, it probably felt just as good for you as I'm sure it felt better for him, but it probably felt just as good for, for <laughs> you to be able to say, Hey, you trust me with $500,000 and, and here's a million dollars back. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, if you know the biblical story about the, the business owner that goes away and hands his servants, the cash and they, they do something with it. Well, I did something. Explain that one for me. What is that? Is that what it is? Yeah. There's a biblical story about how this one uh, business owner, he, he went away and gave three servants cash and said, invest it for me while I'm gone. And the whole point of the story was that one servant said, I know you're a harsh man. And so I just buried it in the ground and here's your money back. And he says, you're worthless. You didn't invest it. You could have put it with a banker. So he kicked him out and uh, you know, took the money away from him and gave it to the guy with a, a lot of, that was very successful. And the, the moral of the story is, is more about if you're going to be working towards the kingdom of God, you need to be working in it and putting forth some, some effort. Right. Uh, and of course, I may get lots of kickback from that, but we're not talking biblical scholarship here. And we'll I, I, but it's interesting. I know you're a man of, of faith and, and you're, you're a Christian. And my last guest, Aaron Johnson, we spent a ton of time going, diving into Mormonism, as I call it. Maybe that's not even the term, but, uh, but no, it's interesting. And it's, it's good that you, you have your faith. That, and that's important to you, right? It is. Not to sidetrack, but has that been something you've been a pretty hardcore Christian like your whole life or did that start when you met your wife or? I've always been connected to God. Yeah. It's just as I've grown and read more and developed more, my relationship has strengthened. Uh, had a lot of growth since the kids left the house. It makes me a lot more ethical. No, I wouldn't say because many Christians, they're just worthless sacks of detritus. Well, I guess everybody in any group could be, you know, there's yeah, um, some of the worst deals I've ever seen were by Christians. They, they were just money hungry. But for me, the Christians are bad. You're saying some people who might use any religion to say, Hey, I'm this and kind of a little bit of a false mask maybe to get in and they're not. Yeah. But it, it's something that's important to me and it's an ethical standard and people that know me, trust me. Uh, Do Overall in business, do you think it, has it been a, a kind of a guiding thing for you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, if you're a serious Christian, it impacts everything in your life every day. And it, it's how you relate to people. And it's also great because all those people that have screwed me over in the past, <laughs> I'm able to forgive them and move on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's, uh, that's important. Yeah. Um, and you still hope that they turn their, their lives around. Uh, you know, I, I got to stick with you until you die because you've already said you're going to be a death deathbed conversion uh, for, I, for yourself. Since there's something, and it's been like a funny joke, and maybe it's not even that funny. I think it's funny, but I always, I always throw that out there. You know that. So I think it's somebody saying, uh, it might be Homer, I'm not sure, where he says, you know, like I'm going for a, I think maybe Bart actually, I'm going for a life of sin followed by a deathbed repentance. Yeah. And it's a funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I hope to be the one that gets you the fire insurance. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm going to have to call you from the Ferrari if I'm going over the cliff or something. That would be like the only part where that scenario wouldn't work, you know? Yeah, well, it's it's in the heart, Brandon. <laughs> but, and, you know, this thing, I've been baptized, okay? So, you know, she, she did her part. She got me. She gave me that little push. Well, we're, there's a little more beyond that, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but uh, you've got a kid now and you've got a wife. Yeah, I do, actually. I have a six-month-old. Well, he's almost seven months. Uh, Vincenzo, Vincent. Benny, Vince, hey you, you know, my fiance's name Morgan. 
and uh, we've been together for about four years. Probably we'll start planning a wedding soon, but you know, it's uh, hard to do during COVID. So <laughs> um, that's, that's kind of to be determined. And you are not a person that can handle a COVID wedding. You, you need people to come in and, and be close to each other. Probably more of the diva than she is. I'm sure I am. And, and <laughs> if it were just up to her, it would be something super small and intimate. And in a way, I, I don't have a problem with that, but it's more, you know, if you, if you really do it once, why not do it kind of big, you know, if you're going to do it, why not? And I don't even know who the hell would come, but I, I, I think we could do it kind of big if we wanted to. Right. So it's just kind of a question of, do you try to do that? Do you wait? I don't know. Uh, how about if we do it at the top of a, a place on Oxford street? Yeah, there you go. We'll finish Before that. It's occupied. We'll finish the 89 condos. And we'll do it on the roof up there. You know, it's not a bad place to do it. Well, one of my condo conversions was in uh, San Pedro and 4th of July, they were shooting off fireworks down at the, the beach down below. So I took my family there and we got on the roof of this empty building and the fireworks are right at eye level. Wow. And uh, that was pretty phenomenal. And the kids are running around on the roof of the building. One of them fell, scraped up, cried, and we had to leave. <laughs> but uh, happens sometimes, I'll tell you. Uh, yeah, you'll experience that. I'm sure I will. Already at seven months, we're experiencing the wildness coming out. You got your genes too. Don't forget that. Yeah, exactly. We're in trouble. So we're in trouble. <laughs> so going back just for a second to the to the conversions, right? So you get this one deal done. The guy gives you five hundred thousand dollars, know, loans it to you, or partners with you, whatever it is. But he puts five hundred thousand. You give him the million bucks back. That was your only partner on that deal. So so you've got like an investor, I should say. He was the only investor on the investor, deal. Yeah. And then you've got a separately like an operating partner. So you've got somebody that has the expertise in condo conversions. That's kind of yeah. more, if you go out and do 10 of them, he's going to be with you on all 10 deals because he's not there just to bring in money. He's bringing the expertise on the navigate the deals. But then the investors are kind of siloed into, you know, if they're in this deal, or if they're in that deal. So you guys go out and do how many after that? I mean, do you just go bananas and start cranking or what happens? Well, he lost everything in the 91 recession. Oh. And he told me, Greg, you don't want to have to make your money twice. <laughs> uh, so but now I have to make my money twice. Four times, I mean, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we uh, started looking. He taught me how to find the deals. And uh, he helped me get uh, connected with the investor that sponsored the next uh, eight deals. Um, and so we have the track record now. We've proven that we can do it. And uh, so it was a 50-50 split with the investor. So he and I got a, a half million to invest and we rolled that into our next project. Gotcha. And then we had another project and he knew somebody at Marcus and Millichap that got us deals. Okay. Commercial real estate bridge, Marcus and Millichap. So another <laughs> few you guys, what off market potential deals that nobody else has seen? Yeah, they were promoting them, but they showed them to us and if they fit our criteria he worked with us and we got them um, and we got the the one in san pedro we had just bought that one in july of 2005 in august uh my mentor and partner had a heart attack and died wow right there and boom just right there meaning like right your guys's new business that you're that you're cranking on just falls over dead Right. So I was slow in transitioning, had a lot of things going on. And um, I regret that, that I moved slow. I should have just gone straight ahead and moved forward uh, because that delay pushed the final sales of that project into the downturn. Why did you slow down? Because of just the loss. I mean, was it a personal thing where you just, you felt bad to this guy? Of course you felt bad. You, I mean, I don't mean to say that. Personal sit loss, but. Um, and you're sitting here going, oh shit, you know, so now everything starts just slowing way down. He was my security blanket. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, you need to do it right. So I said, I'm going to do it right. He wanted us to bring in a contractor to build it out. Mm -hmm. But then a, a new partner and the investor said, no, let's manage it ourselves. It's like, I don't have that much experience in that. But it's so. By the way, easy for them to say. I mean, I know the ones maybe writing the checks, but you had this whole plan to bring in the right professional to help you do this thing. And they said, no, you don't, Greg, you just go do it. Let's save the money. Let's not hire the contractor. Just, just go over there and take care of it. <clears throat> yeah. So that's where I ended up getting my contractor's licenses. Okay. Uh, from that experience. So but, what licenses do you have, Greg, just to jump in? What, which licenses? I have since let them all lapse, but I had my general B oh. contracting license. I had my HVAC, electrical, my plumbing. I was a mold inspector, which is still active. I'm a construction consultant for HUD, 
which that's a lifetime license. I'm still active. I can do consulting for HUD construction loans. And I'm the paper GC, you know, look at these hands. These don't, these hands don't swing hammers. Yeah. Now you th yeah, exactly. But uh, I'm, again, there's where the academia comes in. I can learn and understand all these things. And I did a lot of green construction, green consulting. I start, you know, in the downturn, I was trying to start a green construction company where it was all energy efficiency. And I still have one of the greenest contractors in the world who I will be bringing to you for some development out in the Inland Empire. Yeah, sounds good. Um, but uh, there, there's just, there's a lot that I, I learned from all that about how to, how to run the business and all the licensing, insurance and so and, uh, that kind of dovetailed into you finished that project or the few projects that you had going on and you kind of said, okay, I'm done with condo conversions for a little bit. The market turned and that's when condo conversions were not viable. Right. Uh, we were chasing the market down. I had 70 condos to sell when the market turned and that was all my profit. I had millions of dollars in profit and I was, uh, you know, we knew it was coming. We predicted a year out. If somebody says they were caught by surprise, they're idiots. Yeah. Uh, all the signs were there, but we couldn't exit fast enough. You couldn't slow down the trend. I mean, you got stuff in progress. It's like, you can't just put a sorry work right. and come back next winter kind of thing. Like you had, once you had made the decision to put money to work and dive into some of these deals and start renovations or whatever you were doing, you kind of had to get them done at that point. So now you it's- You had to, there was no other exit. And if I was flipping houses, I would have had houses scattered all over the counties in Southern California. I could have dropped the price on all those houses and been out. But yeah. with condo conversions, you drop the prices, sell a few, drop the prices, sell a few. So as the market's diving down 30, 40%, you're, you're losing money. And we saw the trend and we told all our investors, you know, you're, you're, you're done. My, the highlight of the downturn was going to some people, some investors and saying, Here's 40% of your original capital back. You're lucky to get this much. Wow. So that's a tough scenario. Nobody wants to be in that conversation. No, now, but it, it builds character. I'll tell you that much. But going back to what you, something you said earlier in this, in this podcast was what, you know, as far as like staying power, not locking in a loss, the obvious question I would have at least would be, why didn't you just, if you had 70, you couldn't sell, rent them all. You might even take a monthly negative, but rent them all, preserve the capital, get to the next market. I mean, they once upon a time were, were apartments anyway. Could, yeah. You know, just too heavy, fully levered and you had too much capital at, you know, kind of into the deals at that point where you weren't able to just rent them. Correct. The, they didn't cash flow. And because all my money was coming from each of these transactions, I didn't have the cash flow to cover the monthly nut. Yeah. So I had to have income to feed the family and salvage all the deals. So I was playing defense, feeding the family and trying to reinvest. I had three more than full-time jobs. Wow. And uh, that's where that resulted in the bankruptcy eventually, because I just had to clear the slate so I could focus on what needed to happen. Right. And I still have a $900,000 carry forward tax loss that I need to, uh, to claim. Right now, the IRS lets me take $3,000 a year and I don't think I'm going to live 300 years to use that up. <laughs> Probably not, but, but you never know. But, um, but so how does that work? $900,000 carry forward lot. Can you take that to offset, let's say gains or income you would make? I'm sure I'm not using the right terminology, but you go do an investment next month and you make a $900,000 gain on it that you would have had to pay tax on it. Uh, would have to pay tax on, then you don't have that. This would offset that, or you could Correct. do a bunch of smaller deals over the next five, 10 years where you make X amount of money and you can offset up to that $900,000 because that's there. Is that kind of, uh, yeah, I have to demonstrate that I'm a real estate investor. And as a real estate investor, my investments have lost or I've, I've gained $900,000 and then my carry forward tax loss is offsetting that offsetting that. Okay. But it's only the feds that allowed me to do that. California already wiped it out. California. Okay. Masters. Yeah. Yeah. Are you able to sell that by the way? Can you sell your, your, is that, is that legal? I mean, no, not anymore. Okay. That okay. was taken care of in the 1987 tax law changes. It used to be before that you could have, if you had a lot, you could sell it to somebody that was very active and they could say, hey, I'll give you thousand dollars right now for your $900,000, you know, and losses. Cause maybe they could use it next year on stuff they're doing. Believe me, I, I looked at all sorts of partnership deals with partners and said, hey, uh, you know, we'll, 
you let me make money and then I'll, I'll pay it back because of, I'm, I'm not setting it. And we got close on a structure, but man, it was awfully close to the edge. So, so do you think it's a good time again to do condo conversions? Um, do you, do you think that, uh, if somebody was looking at deals right now, they should, they should consider that as a investment vehicle. <laughs> now that I'm older and wiser and more conservative, <laughs> um, it's dangerous because with a condo conversion, start to finish you're gonna need 18 months if you and you have to see the market that says you've got 18 months of good sales right if you don't have that runway you will die uh, on that condo conversion so what do we have in this marketplace it's still being propped up we yeah. have an uncertain election i still think trump is going to win so we can kick the can down the road they're going to be pumping money into the economy Commercial real estate's just going to be in the crapper. Right. It's 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 going to be hurt. But residential, it'll it'll take a hit, but it, it won't dump like it did in uh, 2007, 8, 9. Well, isn't a big driver of condo sales the fact that houses get expensive at the height of every market, and so people go, "Well, I used to be able to get this track home, but when you know when we were coming out of the recession for four hundred thousand, now I got to pay seven hundred grand to get that same house or eight hundred grand. So now this four hundred thousand dollar, five hundred thousand dollar condo is looking pretty attractive, right? And so we're kind of at that point right now. And the question is, is that yeah. to be that like you're saying, eighteen months, twenty four months? But maybe if you went back two years from now, right, twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen, might have been a good time to pick up some condo conversions. The, the ideal time is to when the market starts heating up. That's when you acquire apartment buildings and do the entitlements. And kind of just quietly sit on them, cash flow. You got the thing anyway, just buy, yeah. just buy some buildings. and wait. That's ideal. So then you have the uh, kind of wait. Otherwise, there's just too much risk. So I've got a friend of mine who sponsored me for condo conversions. He's building 400 apartments right now. Apartments are the big thing. Yeah. You could entitle every single one of those, and they're just going to hold them. Right. But they... Uh, they're not doing condo conversions because there there's a lot of risk. Do you think that any developer that's putting up new apartment buildings would be wise to always record that condo map right out of the gate? Do you think there's a reason they shouldn't? I mean, obviously there's, there's extra, you know, money there's extra there's, and time. And I don't know if there's extra time because you're building something that takes you 18 months anyway. So you could just, you know, jointly run that, but, but there's extra money. Maybe you got to do some things on the building side, slightly different, but I mean, don't you think every developer should just, automatically do a condo map on an apartment building so that for future, maybe the third buyer, fifth buyer, whatever has that map sitting there. It's something that can be very beneficial in the future, mm -hmm. but it, there is an expense to it. And it's uh, one to $300,000. If you've got that amount of cash to sit on, then yeah, it's a good investment. On a small building, maybe that makes an impact when you're building like our clients are spending, you know, with us $32 million to build, this condo and they are their condos so they're doing the map but but you know if you're spending 30 million and their true cost between land and soft costs and i mean they'll they'll be into it for 50 50 60 million i don't know so, so yeah. kind of money three hundred thousand dollars to make sure that somewhere down the line you have you have an ability to do something as a condo if you want to me it seems like it, it would be a no-brainer good thing what makes it of value is that you've got politicians between you and your exit plan hmm. with that condo map or that tract map in place that's a legal document that's recorded on the property and no matter how they change the laws they can't change it and go backwards they can't interest and so you can have condo maps on properties that are not convertible right now but because you've got the track map that's it's the legacy track map you can it's it's convertible now and do you have to extend that every so often or is it or is it no, it's, it's recorded runs with the title it's recorded right okay Interesting. And I know we don't have a ton of time, but, but going back to kind of what you're doing now. So, so tell me about, about your typical, I mean, you're offering services as a lender, as a real estate broker. You, I think you have some business listings. I know you've got another, I don't want to say day job, but you've got the other job that might be winding down right now. So you'll have more time for real estate, but break some of that down for us. I'm a Renaissance man. Um, I'm capable, the, the academic approach, I can do just about anything or learn how to do anything. And I've proven that with all the things I've touched on. Right. Um, I actually, I just had a hairdresser who wow. has, owns a couple of houses wow. and she saved up. So even if you don't make much money, you can save up and have houses. She owns a couple of houses free and clear. We did a 1031 exchange for her. Wow. <clears throat> it was a complex transaction. They needed 
the academic help from me to put it together. And so I kind of, it, it wasn't a full-time job, but I helped her get the transaction and got done. And she's very grateful for that. Oh, but, um, my primary income source that's uh, going away. So it's, but it's also freeing up a lot of time for me. So I've got a friend that's bringing me business listings and he says, let's do some business listings now that you've got some time. So I've got two businesses all list for sale. Okay. Okay. Are, and, uh, are you able to tell us just in general terms what kind of business they are right now in case anybody goes, man, that sounds, yeah. I got a contact. Um, I've got a, uh, a retail store in Huntington beach. That's uh, there's something I think unique, they sell things that aren't on Amazon and they uh, are looking for a partner or they'll sell the whole business outright. Uh, partners wants to exit. He has a daytime job that he wants to focus on, uh, mm -hmm. has other things that he wants to do. So uh, you can get in fairly inexpensively. It's franchisable. Wow. This is a unique enough opportunity that if you build three, four, five uh, separate stores, then you can franchise and this has, this has legs. The other one is something I might want to buy myself, uh, and that's an apartment supply company. Okay, there we go. That's the one we you were talking about as far as you potentially supplying some finished items for us on some of our projects. So it yeah, flooring, appliances, that's a big, <clears throat> big warehouse. Yeah, now that I've got more time, it's like, okay, let, let's talk about you're building this building. I can supply you probably half million to a million dollars worth of material for that facility and uh, and save you money at the same time time money when you're you know we're, we're building 89 condos right and so when we're doing that we can't afford to get down to the end and something doesn't come off the boat from china or home depot doesn't have it or pacific sales doesn't have it or the wrong stuff comes or the budget's all out of whack and that's another thing too being able to reserve stuff in advance is that is that something that that business offers as well that you guys would be able to provide to people uh, as far as you know, long lead time items where, hey, I don't need appliances tomorrow, but I need 89 stoves six months from now or a year from right. now. You make the commitment, uh, there'll be a deposit, and then we hold all those, and they'll probably be warehoused at the actual manufacturer. There'll okay. be a distribution center someplace. When we're ready for them. Right. So we would manage that, that interface. Uh, and, you know, an apartment rep, uh, fitting hotel renovation condo conversion they're all the exact same skill set which i have right so this is falling right into my lap as something i can do to support you and other people that are building apartments renovating hotels or doing condo conversions so like the retail shop this is somebody that owns this this supply business and they contacted you because you're a real estate broker. You're also able to, in that same vein, list businesses for sale. And so they said, Greg, I want to list with you. I want to sell my business. And on this one, you said, hey, maybe I'll buy this one because it's interesting. It's in construction. It's Right. Because I've been mostly preoccupied with the primary income source, I, I've been very judicious about selecting what opportunities I work with mm -hmm. because I can't, can't sacrifice the, the main thing. Right. But uh, now that that's moving on, I have time for this and I've got all sorts of contacts that are saying, Hey, well, Greg, I'll give you a job here. I'll give you a job there. Hey, I've got these listings. I, I, I need a broker that can help me with them. So, so selling into, into other stuff. And that's the thing is that when you've done a hundred million in real estate, you know, people, when people hear that you're available, they start calling you. They start calling you. I know I do. I always try to get you to do something. You and I had this, this like almost storied past together where you used to work with me over at my house flipping business and you've been my mortgage broker before you've been my office controller at the construction company here, right? When we were getting this part going. And so yep. I love when we work together. My goal is someday we'll work together just, you know, permanently in the office every day, but you know, we'll, we'll see how we get there. And that's, that's interesting. You bring up all those things I did for you, <clears throat> controller, analysts, uh, acquiring properties. Uh, now we're looking at uh, supplies, renovations. Have I excelled in all of those things for you? You know what? And I would be the first one to give you a glowing testimonial because you totally have. And the thing I like about you is you are so analytical and you are honest and you're always a good sport for lack of a better term where you'll want to work on a weekend or stay late one evening or whatever the case may be. But for me, I just have always felt that you have the ability and you're trustworthy. And those are the two things that I look for with somebody. And you have a great attitude. You know, if you can put up with some of my shenanigans, right? <laughs> Demanding sometimes. So when we're working together, there can be a little bit of that. And 
no, man, it's, I've always enjoyed working with you and I just appreciate everything that, that you've done for me and my businesses. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're pain in the butt, but that that's only because you make me a better person. You hold me to a really high standard. So to put up with that irritation to become a better person. Oh yeah. Do that any day of the week because you do, you make me a better person by your, your demands and, and you've got big goals yourself. And if you're going to make those, you have to have the high expectations, but it is. I'm, I'm there for you. Oh, a little spazzy. So let me turn it around. So knowing me and inland builders, inland development, my company, you know, why should someone work with Brandon and Ivano and Greg and Brandon and come do stuff with Inland if, if you had to plug us for a second? You know, it's because you are relentless. You are, you're the deal, you're the rainmaker. Actually, that's what you specifically are. You're the one that makes the deals happen. Yeah. Again? Tom Cruise, the movie, The Rainmaker. I think it was. That was well, a- that was Rain Man. That was it. Well, Rain Man he's in, but isn't there a, uh, who's Grisham that does the attorney, <laughs> attorney movies? And there's- oh. But maybe Rainmaker is, um, geez, I forget. Uh, Matt, no, it's not Matthew McConaughey. We're going to look it up after this. There's a movie somewhere. It's a John Grisham movie, the, the, the Rainmaker. But go ahead. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, you, you make things happen. And likewise, you have a very positive attitude. And when I've encountered difficult situations, you were the one that kept me going. Uh, and so, you know, people look to me for my attitude. And you've done wonders for me when I, when I hit uh, tough patches. So working with you and Ivano, Ivano, I mean, he's a street smart, savvy, street fighter developer. Yeah. And, you know, with your relationships and the ability to go forward and never say die and the street fighter, the combination is very, very powerful. And he's also got access to lots, buildable lots. What is it? 6,000 lots worth to develop in the Inland Empire. Um, you know, plus you didn't even do that and you pull out a, an 89 condo development in downtown Los Angeles, seven stories above ground. You've got a couple below ground. Uh, this is pretty serious stuff. You're a player in that market. And, you know, a few years ago, five years ago, eight years, 10 years ago, you, you know, people may not have predicted that you would have gone from a broker to building a high rise in downtown LA. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, even some days I'm like, wow, how did this, you know, <laughs> have to give major credit to the team members that have been around me, to our clients that are trusting us, to, you know, people like you and my right hand man, Greg Foster, and everybody that's awesome Love Greg. At our company. And, um, you know, mostly to Ivano because Ivano took a big trust in, in me and our team as well, right? Here's a guy who's been building for 40 years could partner with anybody or with nobody has lots of land can you know do a number of things and he decides that he wants to be in business with Brandon he wants to be in business with Greg he wants to start this company and that you know we're going to go out together and make something you know kind of special happen so you know, it's, it's, do you remember me telling you about my mentor he yeah the 300 million a year company he crashed and burned in the 91 recession uh, but he wanted to partner he was watching me and partnered with me you've got the same thing in Ivano you guys are a fantastic team and I've seen the other people around you like Greg Foster. He's fantastic. Uh, and you've got other great people around you and, uh, you know, I'm there to support you when you need it. And if we can do the, uh, you get you good prices on the materials, you know, this right. is a continued relationship I want with you. Right now you're my, my part-time Jedi. I call you when we, we need to do some deals. We'll definitely be talking about those finishes. We've got some other stuff going on, but, but sooner than later, our orbits will come back into every day together i know it's going to happen so um you know greg i i really think how can we end on a better note than all that i i really appreciate that you came on to my second podcast it just worked out where i had aaron last week i probably would have had you as number one but number two is pretty damn good and i appreciate uh you know the time it's my pleasure yeah so we'll uh we'll stay in touch and if anybody wants to get in contact with you what they can go to greg sharp real is that the website uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm bringing that up, uh, gregsharprealestate.com. Uh, basically, I am looking for uh, high net worth individuals, family offices that are wanting a real estate consultant that understands investments. Uh, I'm, I'm not good for helping housewives find houses and they're concerned about colors of kitchens. Yeah. Too emotional, not my deal. But when it comes to analysis and building a strategy and executing a plan to build wealth, that's where I excel. And that's going to be the high net worth people in the family offices. 
So, and e even yourself, you're building a portfolio um, and I, I can help you on various aspects of that portfolio building. You don't have to be super high net worth right now when we can make a difference. Absolutely. It's like the, the hairdresser that has the house is free and clear. We did the 1031. That's investment specific uh, activity. That's great. That's great, man. Well, I, I want to say thanks again. And this concludes our podcast number two, the high stakes deals. And we'll talk soon, everybody. All right. Take care. Um, thanks, Greg. Appreciate it, man. Bye.